Okay, I will let you do the, the grand welcome. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. So thanks everyone. We see we have a um, um, super good number of people. We're all excited that you are joining us today. Um, again, apologies for those who, jo for those who joined um, just now. Um, we know there were some people confused about time zone. So um, we do apologize. It's because um, we're all in different time zones. So sometimes even if maybe a, um, a Teams um, meeting is forwarded, it might um, come up in your inbox with a, with a weird time zone. Uh, and on this note, uh, while we wait for um, uh, more people to uh, um, to join potentially, we want to ask you to write in the chat um, what time is it where you're joining us from. Um, so we kind of get the grasp of where you are located in the world. So I'll start. For me, it's 6.06 uh, 06 a.m. because I'm joining from 80 right now. Uh, so it's quite early in the morning. Um, I know for um, uh, for Christine is uh, it's 11. 11. 11 yes. <laughs> South Sudan, 1:60 uh, p.m. Great. Thanks, Mohammed, for joining us. 2:06 Yemen. Hi, everyone. 2:06. Okay. Nice. Great, keep on the um, time zone uh, coming in. Um, while, uh, yeah, we give a little bit of a background of this webinar, which has been organized in cooperation between the um, ABA Working Group and the Community Engagement Forum. Um, so as, um, as I said, it's 6 a.m. for me, so I have my coffee, even if it's not the uh, community engagement coffee and chat, but uh, still needed that at this time in the morning. Um, and um, we um, we did this um, webinar because we cooperated on the um, preparation of two case studies and we have um, colleagues who um, supported us in the preparation of the case study showcasing how um, they are engaging with um, displacement affected communities in out of camps uh, responses. Um, next slide. Sorry. Um, and so maybe we'll start with just a very brief introduction of the Community Engagement Forum and the ADA Working Group. Um, I'll give uh, the chance to um, um, Christine to say a few words on the Community Engagement Forum. Um, maybe if you receive this uh, invitation through the ADA Working Group uh, contact list, you might not know about the Community Engagement Forum. So uh, good to, uh, uh, for you to know that this platform ex exists. Over to you, uh, Christine. Thanks, Elena. Um, so um, my name is Christine, and I am the moderator for the Community Engagement Forum, which is an uh, online community of practice on how to engage people in displacement responses. Um, it's an interagency. Um, open for everyone and um, community of practice and um, we are part of the CCTM cluster but it is uh, both open to and relevant for um, practitioners from any sector or any cluster um, as community engagement is the, the cross-cutting issue. Um, just a little bit about what we do um, and I will share the link later on on how you can join if you're not already a member of this uh, community of practice. We have monthly um, community coffee and chat sessions, which are informal um, um, online sessions where we discuss um, different community engagement topics every month. Um, we organize uh, more in-depth webinars and workshops on specific topics um, that are requested by the four members, such as this one today. Um, we uh, offer tailor-made support through um, coaching and trainings that are um, based on need and request from the forum members. Um, the uh, forum is moderated by me um, uh, via NRC. <coughs> and, um, 
We are, in addition to being guided by the CCM cluster, we also have a rotating advisory board from different um, um, agencies and uh, locations um, um, uh, that changes every six months. Um, and they help us make sure that this community engagement forum is relevant also for the field pr practitioners and not only for people based in head office and regional offices. So that's a little bit about the community engagement forum. Back to you, Elena. Thanks. And now a few words on the area-based approach working group. Um, it's a working group uh, within the Global System Cluster. It's co-chaired by um, me from IOM side and uh, Francesca Rancati, who is here with us today from NRC side. Um, I'm going to post uh, the, um, uh, the link to the area-based approach uh, webpage of the working group where you can subscribe um, uh, to our mailing list if you want. Uh, that's uh, the QR code also uh, links you to the um, to the web page. Um, the objective of the working group is to explore and document how um, system practitioners have been adapt adapting uh, system approaches uh, through, um, sorry, system activities through area-based approaches. Um, and we're currently working on um, a few things despite like on top of the of the case studies that we're going to also publish on the on the web page um, where we, we have been working on a trading package and we will give updates on this um, at the end of the webinar. Um, something we have uh, been working on also it's a collection of resources on area based approaches. Uh, next slide. Um, and I'm also uh, linking it uh, here in the in the chat to you, or you can uh, use the QR codes on the on the slides to um, to download it from the web page. Um, it's a matrix that has um, links to different um, resources from webinars to online presentation uh, to case studies that are linked to um, um, area based CCM. Uh, you also have um, at the column in the middle that kind of summarized through keywords the main um, issues uh, that the resource is focusing on. Um, and so, as we said today, we have two uh, case studies that looks directly on um, uh, community engagement activities uh, done by CCM practitioners who have adapted their activities through our based approaches. Um, and um, we're going to have two brief presentations by our speakers on the two case studies that will be also published on um, the Community Engagement Forum and the Area-Based Approach um, webpage. Um, but we also want to give you the opportunity to ask some questions to our uh, to our speaker at the end through a um, kind of a panel discussion. Uh, where we will uh, uh, look specifically at sharing and discussing good um, best practices, but also challenges on engaging the communities in non-traditional camp settings. Um, next slide. So we prepare, um, uh, oh, ah, we have the hashtag first. <laughs> Sorry, before launching the, the Mentimeter to gather the, um, uh, the question for our panel discussion, um, we also have launched an hashtag on the Community Engagement Forum um, where um, we can publish resources uh, so that if you are definitely looking for specific resources on community engagement in area-based approaches, you can select them through the hashtag, right, Christine? Am I explaining this correctly? That was perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Um, so we really hope that you're going to use this hashtag on the on the community engagement forum. Um, so again, as I ash community engagement and area based approaches as as highlighted in the slides. Um, next slide. So I'll encourage you to go to www.menti.com. You can insert the code 64926548, or you can also just scan uh, the QR code you see in the, um, in the slides. 
um, we prepare for you slides asking you um, questions on that you might want to ask our speaker later um, in the uh, in the panel. So you can move freely between the slides. Uh, I'm just going to um, quickly show you um, the questions. Share my screen. Hopefully. Um, Now we're just seeing a conversation. Yeah. It's coming, hopefully. Yeah, I think you should see it. No, oh, we're seeing oh, it. Sorry. A team's conversation. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> My team's is a bit low this morning. Probably it was a bit surprised we're working at 6 a.m. <laughs> it's not used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, does anyone have any problems accessing the Menti? Hi, for people who possibly were a bit late, can yeah. you reshare the link? Thank you. Um, I'll do that after this, yes. Yeah, okay. So as you can see, you can move, move freely through the slides. Um, we're asking you what are the biggest challenges you face in engaging the community in a non-traditional camp setting. Um, we're asking you some um, ideas also. Uh, on how we can make community engagement uh, work successful in a non-traditional camp setting, as well as uh, if you have any additional questions on the case studies, uh, we're going to present one on um, Afghanistan and one on Burkina Faso. So feel free to move uh, through the slides and add your question. It's at your own pace, so um, you you can move through the slide or and through the presentation as we go um, as we go through the case study presentation, and uh, I'm going to um, drop in the uh, in the chat the link and and the code. But just to uh, if you haven't had the chance to scan the QR code, you can just go to um, www.menti.com and use the code six four nine two six five four eight. Great, and now we um, we give uh, I give the floor to Christy, who is going to introduce our first speakers and the first case studies on Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we have the first um, case study. Jahanseb, my previous colleague from NRC, um, Jahanseb Daudzai, will um, share um, his experience from um, setting up this uh, community-led project, um, as well as some updates on how it's going and a um, uh, little bit about the process and, and the tools and the challenges. So I'll just hand over to you, Jahanseb, if that's okay. And I'll, I'll share the presentation here. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity and sharing my experience with all of you. I will be happy to have you uh, questions and can share your uh, same experience like this so we'll learn from each other. Uh, I'm sharing, uh, I'm Jahanzeeb Dawuzay. I, I was a part of uh, uh, a camp management or urban displacement out of camp uh, team in eastern uh, Afghanistan. So if you see the map of Afghanistan, so uh, in this next slide, uh, you can see uh, the Nangrahar, which is the very nearly to uh, Pakistan. And when there was a, a forced evacuation by uh, uh, Pakistan, 
So, or uh, the uh, defeat of um, Taliban in the first time in 2001. So, in 2005, uh, or uh, at the beginning, uh, people uh, returned, the refugee returned from Pakistan to this nearby um, uh, province. And there, uh, there was a settlement, some settlements were established, specifically a Sheikh Misri uh, settlement or a village. You can see uh, that in the next slide. Uh, that is uh, uh, a cent the center of Nangrahar province is Jalabad city, and there is the Sheikh Misri. Uh, you can see the arrow goes there. Uh, it calls uh, Sheikh Misri uh, uh, settlement, which is 14 kilometer far. It is looking like 14 kilometer is near, but the way is unpaved or still unpaved and uh, there were uh, like mostly the people uh, like approximately 2500 families displaced people 75 percent among them approximately were returnees who returned back from pakistan and settled there and 25 percent were the internally displaced uh, population it was established uh, in 2005, and uh, additionally, they have some uh, 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 some other uh, villages by uh, added some more villages, increasing the issues around the land rights and access to the resources like water, agricultural land, and uh, education and employment uh, in general. Looking to these uh, needs, uh, fortunately, in two. In the end of 2016 and in the beginning of 2017, uh, NRC, Norwegian Refugee Council uh, in Eastern region, it was active and uh, we had a project and a pilot project, uh, which was from camp management, uh, camp management, but specifically using urban displacement out of camp approach there, where there was IDP, returnee and house community were living together so we used uh, that approach there established community representative committees i was uh, one of the member of that uh, team and from the beginning till end um, and uh, this uh, sheikh misri was one of the uh, place so we established community representative committee by dividing the uh, the the place using the uh, geographical areas as a neighborhood and then identifies uh, uh, identify uh, through uh, a selection process uh, or uh, election process uh, like um, um, we can say that uh, six uh, female uh, representative from each uh, each of the neighborhood we're having male and female uh, separately uh, these uh, representatives and uh, they were trained um, for uh, a, a year. Uh, after a year, uh, we in 2018 they uh, they were able to identify. I mean, not when even or after six months uh, when they were understood and they uh, started to have problem identification uh, on problem solution uh, meetings. They identifies that there is lack of independence specifically for females. Uh, actually, Afghanistan is a uh, is a sensitive for female uh, representation, or females are mostly uh, sitting in a home and uh, they are not uh, engaging in economic activities on outside. But NRC were able to uh, identify or establish community representative committees. That is a another uh, issue. But uh, they started to identify this. Uh, female were like not uh, independent economically. There was domestic violence for various reasons in the families for the females. Uh, and specifically the the females I defied this. There is lack of, um, uh, I mean, resources or uh, shops or those areas where females can come together or uh, or purchase uh, their needed uh, daily needed uh, items. Actually, the long distance you you saw uh, you are uh, seeing that this is an unpaid way, an unsecured way, where uh, 
uh, in Afghanistan, female uh, cannot, or specifically in the uh, displaced community, female cannot go without a male uh, or a mahram uh, to bazaar, uh, to market. And if that is an unsafe way, so that is impossible for them. And if they were economically uh, uh, poor as well, and they couldn't spend or use public or uh, private transportation to go these areas. And e even though uh, they also identify that they cannot ask the male uh, staff, you, you may have a question in your mind that why they can ask their male, but even in as a sensitivity of some of the items, some of the specific items uh, like female are using uh, specific uh, cosmetics or other uh, other uh, clothes uh, uh, they are using. They couldn't ask the male to uh, bring those from the bazaar and male couldn't afford those things like you know, uh, going outside, also feeding their families and uh, bringing those things for the females. Females are mostly in uh, this community. They were having hens and uh, taking care of them, and they were they were collecting, uh, se uh, selling uh, uh, eggs. And uh, after that, they were, they had some income at that time, and they were uh, they were uh, keeping those money for uh, fulfilling their uh, basic needs. So the female community uh, community. Uh, identified uh, that this this is a problem and they prioritize it uh, for this we uh, we need to uh, work and we need to uh, find a solution for this so after like many uh, uh, suggestions there was a prioritize the committees uh, suggested uh, 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 female uh, shops uh, female shops in each of the neighborhood uh, and they also uh, uh, develop a BOQ, uh, BOQ uh, which is budget uh, of quantities of all of the items which are needed for females. And also they shared that with NRC and uh, and asked that if there is any, any available uh, funding for these items. So we can uh, we can see the challenges uh, in the next slides that how they can like when, uh, uh, reach those things at though and they also uh, did that step by step like asking uh, in the community so what can be the items or the need assessment kind of things if we have a shop only for females so what could be the items in the shops and those things so they they listed all of the things and uh, then came uh, back with uh, our uh, community uh, uh, or uh, urban displacement out of camp team led there to the female uh, staff and uh, these things were sh uh, shared uh, by them. Uh, fortunately, we had a fi a flexible funding thanks to the donor at that time. Uh, we had, uh, we designed, uh, we heard the consultation or the uh, suggestion uh, from the uh, uh, community representative committees and uh, we designed uh, with them uh, a woman shop what is needed there and needed. also involved okay, also involved uh, male community representative committee to support that actually that had uh, that uh, took uh, a little bit longer process as well to convince those male and to find uh, those the, the female representative committees also identified a male who a female uh, mostly uh, widow uh, i hear uh, i remember there were there were two or three were widows uh, who were uh, who needed the economical uh, support as well, and who had the skills, and uh, they had space and time and uh, and willingness to have a shop, a home-based shop. And their males also agreed to give uh, them a room uh, in their uh, home to establish that uh, that shop, and allocated the room in their household and. Which, which was mainly uh, for the uh, females. NRC uh, used that BOQ and uh, provided or spent uh, uh, three thousand and five hundred dollars for each of the shops, and that there were five shops at that time uh, for females. They were also trained uh, by our staff, uh, for a female staff, how to keep the record and how to, uh, I mean, uh, use, like how to bring or their male uh, 
they messed up our, our male uh, uh, family members uh, to support them to uh, to bring the uh, uh, the from wholesales and then uh, keep them there and use uh, their uh, their uh, I mean uh, uh, to sell that in their home. We found that very uh, outstanding and excite, uh, excitement that uh, 30, uh, approximately 30 women were using those shops for their basic needs. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, our female committees uh, started uh, to have a promotion for those shops um, using word of mouth, going to the weddings and uh, uh, telling to the uh, to the other women uh, specifically uh, sitting in the uh, uh, NRC community representative uh, uh, community center and talking about the shops and uh, saying that and also sharing their experiences what we need and those shops were uh, very much uh, famous uh, among those things and it actually we we understood uh, after that that women were used uh, i mean uh, they had easily access to the uh, shops and then uh, some uh, in some points there uh, some sexual violence were also review uh, reduced as like it was very difficult after like establishing that or before that we understood that female cannot uh, were uh, uh, didn't uh, couldn't uh, speak about their needs to the shopkeepers who were, who were male uh, in even in market and like if, if a female is uh, is purchasing uh, openly if I, I can say that if, if a female is purchasing a bra so she couldn't uh, tell that what size of uh, that can uh, I uh, purchase or uh, can give that so it was uh, a very difficult thing for them but after like hearing back from the females they were very happy and uh, saying we we can easily come together and uh, sit in uh, this and we do not uh, uh, think about any affair sharing our personal needs with our female uh, female uh, shopkeeper and they are also the females themselves were uh, economically independent who had who owned the uh, shop uh, there and supported by uh, inrc and uh, the human resource or the rent uh, or uh, those who were going to the market they were also reduced so uh, generally the excess and the um, problem was successfully solved and surprisingly when I visited that after two or three years uh, I had the last visit when I had the last year with NRC I had uh, the chance to visit back I actually when I was in the eastern region uh, in Jalabad I had chance to come back uh, uh, to join uh, central uh, region or uh, Kabul uh, for another uh, mobile site management or uh, urban displacement out of camp team uh, team to uh, support another project, but the uh, the project uh, there in Jalalabad was closed because of uh, various uh, reasons, security reasons. There was uh, bomb blast and refugee uh, uh, and uh, other, the refugee department uh, in the eastern region, and there was ISIS active as well. So. Unfortunately, NRC uh, somehow reduced the staff and stopped the project. But surprisingly, when I went back there, I saw that there were uh, shops active. I only uh, found two of them very active, had more I uh, items there. They increased their uh, their uh, their budget uh, for the uh, uh, for the shops, and also they were bringing more. Even they were uh, they were selling. Uh, uh, children's uh, clothes or like uh, they were also uh, used in selling uh, uh, the clothes of uh, women. At the beginning when we started that, that was for uh, only for the cosmetics and uh, other uh, useful female uh, things. But when I read there, they, they were able to, uh, to have other items needed for women uh, in a uh, appropriate uh, price. And I remember that I purchased uh, uh, some items for myself there as well and it was in a reasonable, reasonable uh, price uh, yeah this is the, like just uh, go back to one slide so i can i can show you one yeah sorry uh, yeah this one this one uh, you can see that uh, there is a shop uh, there, there in the uh, left side uh, 
this is a picture I took there at, at that time. Um, uh, the the father of that lady who owned the shop in their home, uh, he started to build another shop, a bigger one. You can see that this is a six meter or even 10 meter shop. So that was uh, under construction at that time. And his father was ha very happy that my daughter, who is widow, and living with me, she is independent, and uh, uh, now I'm building uh, uh, or constructing this shop, which will be bigger enough and will use. And this is a uh, well constructed uh, uh, material as well. So uh, that was under construction at that uh, time. Unfortunately, I couldn't uh, had another chance to go with, uh, there, and how that will be there. And they they had another uh, backside door as well, so people can come uh, there and uh, use it. So that was one of the example how that that was successful. So if we go uh, to other uh, other uh, place, so uh, you can see uh, two slide back. Uh, so you can uh, after this, I mean not back uh, after this. Yeah. Yeah, after this. Uh, yeah, this one. You can see there are clothes of uh, women. So these pictures were also taken by me after uh, several years. So there, there you can see in the clothes. Uh, so they they can sell those clothes or those uh, 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 garments uh, to the uh, women there, and they can see uh, or uh, use the uh, available uh, tailoring uh, places. So uh, for them themselves, with very reasonable and uh, very uh, low price for for them, uh, or uh, uh, so. And people were also happy when I couldn't uh, had chance to speak. Actually, we had the female staff there. They visited some of the uh, uh, female uh, uh, houses. I also. Spoke Spoke with uh, with the community members there, and they were very happy that okay, our females are uh, happy and they can purchase these things, and we are not involved in this. And they, they feel shy as well uh, to purchase those uh, females' activity uh, things. But there's very accessible, near to the neighborhood, and uh, accessible for all of the females uh, there. And they were they were uh, looking happy. Uh, actually, that was a uh, general uh, visit there for. Uh, there, so there are some other pictures as well. You can see there. Uh, there are uh, in the next slide. You can see uh, some pictures of shoes even there, and their uh, shampoos and other other things. So uh, all of the things were in under one floor in one uh, place. So uh, and mm, and very uh, low prices. And it it happened uh, through the community uh, participation. We use the area best uh, approach up, uh, appropriately there, identified the uh, neighborhood, and then the community representative committees were identified, they were trained, and they were uh, the voice of the, uh, the displaced community. They themselves uh, uh, identified the problem, suggested the solutions. We only supported in some case, but they run that themselves and solve their own problem by themselves. Uh, mm, I don't know if I covered everything. The the details in, in the in the case study and Christine is here to help me as well, and I can uh, answer uh, any question if you have. Thank you. I think you did a a perfect job in covering as much as possible in little time. So I'll uh, I'll let uh, uh, Elena. Have the word again. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so we we tackle community engagement from the angle of a community-led project, specifically targeting women and girls in Afghanistan. Um, and with the next case studies, we are flying. We are taking a um, a flight to Burkina Faso, um, and we're going to look at um, community engagement through the angle of uh, the establishment of mixed uh, community committees. Um, we have um, two speakers with us today. We have Magdalena, um, who is uh, who's working with ACTED, and she is the technical coordinator of ACTED in country for CCCM, but also the um, co-cluster coordinator of the uh, GSAT, uh, the 
how the system cluster is called in um, Burkina Faso. Uh, and we have also Amelie, our colleague from IMPACT. Um, Magdalena, Amelie, are you with us? Can you say hi? Hi, everyone. We're here. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll let Amelie start. Um, um, sure. Um, just who's displaying the presentation? Yeah, we're going back. To I will do that now. OK, cool. Um, so maybe while we wait for the presentation to load, um, just a word of introduction. So thanks, um, Elena, for, for the introductions. I'm Anneli and I'm with Magdalena as well. So we'll split the presentation into two parts. Uh, first, impact and then acted. Um, but just like uh, both Magdalena and I are really just translators of the activities that was implemented in Burkina Faso because our colleagues uh, do not all speak English, uh, but they really are the field team who implemented the project. So we're just here to um, bring their voice to this um, working group. But really, if you have questions, we'll be happy to, to reply or to pass the questions to the field team um, if we don't have the answers ourselves. Um, but yeah, so today we're going to present a project that has been implemented in Burkina Faso um, one year ago, two years ago. That is an Agora project, which is an initiative, a joint initiatives from ACTED and IMPACT. Um, so ACTED is a, a French NGO um, intervening specifically in uh, CCC and Maria, not only, but, uh, but particularly in, in CCC and Maria in Burkina Faso. And IMPACT, we are a Swiss uh, NGO specialized in research and uh, needs assessment. Um, so next slide, please. Great. Um, so the Agora project has been uh, developed in the city of Fadangurma, which is at the, in the east region of Burkina Faso. Uh, so just a little bit of context uh, for Burkina Faso. So the, um, the crisis in Burkina started back in 2015 with some uh, incidents caused by armed groups, uh, specifically in the north and eastern regions of the country. But it started to be um, like a, an actual humanitarian crisis in 2019 with the activation of the cluster system. Um, and so since four years now, almost five years, we have a protection crisis that is actually causing displacements, um, massive displacements in the countries, specifically, as I was saying, in the northern and, and eastern regions of the country. And what we see is that we have an increasing number of IDPs coming to urban areas, uh, such as Pada and Goma, which is the biggest city in the S region. Um, and, and IDPs are, are going to these urban centers for obvious reasons, like access to econ economic opportunities, to, um, but also to a safe, um, safe place. So, Based on this context and also the context of the city of Fada having like a um, large influx of IDPs coming to the city, um, there was a need to actually review the city plan uh, because we found out that the local authorities have developed a communal development plan back in 2017, but it wasn't out of it was outdated because of the new dynamic in the in the city. So there was a need to update this and to see how the dynamic had involved uh, has evolved in the in the city. How the city could actually um, reply to this uh, new dynamic, having more and more IDPs in the in the peripheries, for instance. So, so there was a need to actually update this. And that was the, the starting point of the project Agora. As you can see on the map, so you have the urban extension of the city of Fada and Gurma. So you can see in yellow the, um, the buildings that were here in 2018, 2019, which was the very beginning of the crisis. And then in purple and, and like um, pink, you have the buildings that were created um, in the following years. So as you can see, you have really this densification of the of the urban um, 
of the of the the urban part and and also the um, um, settlements of new people in the peripheries of the of the city, which is uh, which poses the questions of access to land, access to basic services for this population um, in this in this urban territory. And in fact, what we see in the numbers is that. Back in 2022, we reached the point where we had the same proportion of IDPs um, as the proportion of host community in the city of Fada. So you see the number about 70,000 people, uh, which is, of course, a very new dynamic in the city that needs to be understood and also to um, and reflected in the in the urban documents and urban uh, communal development plans. Next slide, please. So based on this, we started to do what we call a area based evaluation or diagnosis. Uh, so this is basically just to take the time to conduct um, a series of key informant interviews, focus group discussions, uh, to really get to understand um, the territory, to understand how it is structured, where the people are, what are the dynamics, what are, where are the basic infrastructures that they use, what is the level of functionality of these infrastructures, so that we can really understand what is what is the territory territory look like now so that we can prioritize the areas where we can have some interventions. Um, so that was done by impact at the very beginning of the project. Um, so as you can see on the on the pictures, uh, one of the um, the most interesting, I would say, uh, activity is this mapping activity that we do with the communities. So it's really about drawing on a map uh, where are the the people uh, where do the people go when they arrive in the city where are the infrastructures and then we can conduct uh, additional surveys with this um, uh, with the service providers for these infrastructures to evaluate the level of functionality um, but really this consultation phase that help us to have a, a better understanding of the territory next slide please Based on this uh, initial area-based assessment, uh, we are able to have a better picture of the needs and also of the dynamics on the territory. And based on this, we conduct a participative um, um, prioritization. So with the communities, with the local authorities, we have the sessions of like, this is the results that we have based on our area-based assessment. What do you think? Do you validate this result? And then if we all agree on the results, what, what do we need to, to do? Where should we focus the interventions? What kind of interventions are the priority according to you, et cetera, et cetera. So these sessions are really about validating the understanding of the territory and also planning together and prioritize together with the community and with local authorities so that we can pass this to our partners. So in that case, it was acted. In some cases, you have more partners in this type of initiatives. But the idea is really to uh, summarize in what we call a recovery plan all the all the needs that we have uh, assessed, but also the priorities that has been defined so that the actors can ju then just take this recovery plan and then put into actions uh, the priorities that are identified. So this is what we've done with IMPACT, and then we pass this to ACTED. And I will hand over to my colleague Magdalena so that she can explain a little bit what ACTED has done based on this first area-based assessment. Thanks. Thank you, over Aaron. to you, Maj. Thanks. If we can move to the next slide. So as Amelie mentioned, uh, we this uh, assessment allowed us to prioritize the areas, but also to identify uh, infrastructures, uh, their location, areas of pressure, and the needs. Uh, so on one hand, this information, the first part of the work was sharing this information uh, in coordination forums on where were those gaps. And that allowed uh, 
out other actors who maybe didn't have uh, enough funding to do assessments that were uh, so widespread to target specific uh, locations and refine their targeting to answer to those needs. If we look at the map uh, where, uh, so to the left side is one section, uh, those two sections, one and 11, they're not very visible, but to the east side, uh, there these uh, two sectors were t considered as one unit or one zone that carried the déplacé in the beginning. Um, uh, based on these assessments. And another uh, area of concentration was the sectors that are more uh, to the left side, uh, that was considered another unit uh, made of two sectors. The challenge in um, having uh, representation, community representation in those two sectors is really visible on the map. It was very uh, logistical a uh, question of reaching everyone uh, in the community in order to have a representative, uh, a representative group. So uh, when we talk about uh, the next step of actually engaging uh, the community, setting up the committees in a way where everyone would feel included and represented across uh, this uh, geographic uh, was one of the issues and we relied a lot on the local authorities to help us reach key persons in the different areas and to, ho to help us mobilize uh, the community. If we can go to the next slide. So in uh, each of these two groups uh, of areas, um, we uh, focused uh, most of our uh, uh, our initial efforts on setting up what we call a mixed community committee. It's mixed because it has IDPs and uh, host communities, also women uh, and men and different age groups, and tries to also be representatives of persons uh, with disabilities. Uh, the process, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, was launched or helped uh, was catalyzed by the local authorities who guided us to key IDP representatives and other key persons in the community, which allowed us to invite more people to a general assembly uh, where we explain the idea of the project, the idea of this next community committee, uh, who it's made up of, what are their roles and responsibilities, uh, and we have a second General Assembly to go back uh, on this uh, topic and explain and spread the message more to understand who could be interested in taking part of this uh, committee and to make sure that it is diverse. So the process uh, that follows is um, a voting that's done on a later date after the General Assemblies and we let the information we give time for the information uh, to flow and everybody, uh, as much people as possible to be included. Um, it starts with a smaller group uh, vote by show of hands on uh, people who were, uh, who showed their uh, candidature uh, to be a member of the committee. And after that initial vote, uh, they turn around to a larger group and people would uh, either generally agree with the voting uh, or not. And based on that, the committee members uh, are half uh, like somewhat uh, voted for uh, or selected uh, in a participatory manner. Following, um, excuse me. Following um, the selection of the members, we can uh, go to the next slide. Um, there is a process of uh, going more into details into their roles and responsibilities and having going over different uh, key topics that uh, would be the framework uh, of their work, uh, like humanitarian principles, um, negotiation skills and other um, types of skills that are needed within the community or within the site. Um, we see here uh, trainings that are mixed between the community members, but we also have the community volunteers that are an extension 
of the CCM or uh, the mixed community committees. Uh, the, the link that this committee has with uh, the local uh, authorities um, has also grown over time. So uh, the local authorities did help us in the beginning to identify key persons. However, the idea was still new. So the more the a committee was trained and the more they were active in their role, uh, the more uh, they were able to gain legitimacy and play a role that's closer with the local uh, authorities there or the local uh, site manager uh, that's assigned. So the site manager ended up uh, working directly with the committees. Uh, other NGOs also uh, uh, referred to them as they became more and more known and their role uh, became more central. We see them here in uh, the community center. So one community center was constructed in each of the two grouped areas. And one of them really played a role where it attracted other uh, little market spaces or other community centers done by other agencies and really turned into a hub of community activities around that center. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier that one of the successes of uh, of the inf of having this information in the beginning was also to facilitate coordination. Um, however, I'll hand it back uh, for Amelie to ex uh, explain the limitations of such an uh, uh, of such an uh, of such an approach. Sure, thanks, Marjolina. Very quickly, um, I think the main difficulty we had is to prioritize uh, specific sectors in the city because Fada is a really big city and it was it was hard to manage expectations also with local authorities, mainly with local authorities, but also with the communities, explaining that we would target only few areas um, within the city, whereas they feel like the entire city would need uh, interventions or like would need to be prioritized. But yes, this is a very difficult exercise to explain that due to our resource constraints, right now we cannot target all the entire territory we have to to prioritize so this is um i would say this is the main challenges a challenge that we faced is to manage expectation and also to explain that acted will take uh, some of the priorities that we have identified, but not all of them uh, we have explained for instance some actions um, implement Um, I don't know if that we are lost. Yeah, I think we lost Amelie. Uh, Amelie, okay. can you hear us? Yes, can you can you hear me? Yes, you're back. Ah, uh, okay. Um, not sure where it cut, but basically, bottom line was that it was it was hard to explain to manage expectation both on the. taken, um, translated into actions, interventions by ACTED, because this recovery plan was also meant to be a tool for local authorities to do some advocacy to other NGOs so that they could take uh, some of the priorities um, and, and do interventions. Um, Amelie, you keep on cutting uh, also at the same time. So it's like team doesn't want us to know what are the um, lessons learned of engaging with uh, community in this sense. Um, Maidalina, maybe you can uh, you can just continue and then we can uh, go back to uh, to this point of the presentation when when we do the question and answer session at the end.
Sorry, do you want me to stop sharing? Uh, no, I think Madalina, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yes, okay, great. Um, do you want to maybe uh, say a few things to, to wrap up on the case studies before we go to the um, panel uh, yes. discussion? If we can go to the next slide and final one. OK, so that's just an update uh, from uh, this year, from uh, two weeks ago, actually, on uh, where are these uh, committees and community centers and what happened to the configuration and the mapping uh, that which was initially done. So uh, there is a new configuration and the initially proposed or the initial logic of it, intervention and split of uh, committees has been readjusted by the local authorities, as we see on uh, the map. And uh, this photo is a photo of the uh, new committee. So there, uh, the committee is renewed uh, uh, entirely, or a few of its members are renewed every six months or every year uh, in its entirety. So this is the members of the new committee after they had their handover meeting with the previous committee, having their first meeting with the local authorities. We can see they're back uh, here from the Ministry of Humanitarian Action. So the um, site manager that's in site and a few members uh, that uh, helped in their uh, renewal of this uh, committee. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, um, we're going back to the um, to the questions um, you share in the Mentimeter right now, and we're going to uh, questions and, and inputs, and we're going to pick some of them and and ask them to um, our speaker. Um, and um, I've already seen there are some like key trends, uh, so we can. Um, we can group them because there are some recurrent topic, uh, which is quite interesting to see. Um, as I think it was quite interesting to also see that, uh, you know, between the two case studies, even if um, it was a very, um, it's about two very different topics, there were also some uh, recurrent, um, uh, recurrent uh, key actions that were taken, including, including, for example, uh, community mapping uh, as we have two lovely pictures showing these activities. Um, so the first um, questions I asked you was, how can we make our community engagement work successful in a traditional camp setting? And um, there are different uh, inputs that you share, which I thank you a lot for. Um, sorry, the first question was actually about challenges. So I'm going back to the first question. And uh, there were some like key recurrent topics. One was about um, um, high community expectation. Um, so since um, uh, Maidalina and Amelie um, briefly touched about this um, and the fact that, uh, you know, there were also high expectation in regards uh, to the assistance um, that was coming from, uh, from the local authority size and the capacity to cover the whole city. Um, I would like to ask you, Madalina, if you can maybe expand a bit on how from like your side you manage high expectation from the community point of view, if you have any um, any mm, good lesson learns to share on, um, on how you work with the mixed uh, community committee on this. Uh, when it comes to the frustrations of the CCM, it was uh, more about how are they handling uh, uh, once they became more active and they became uh, uh, more legitimized, it became more of a frustration uh, that they could not uh, necessarily respond uh, to the communities asking them uh, for follow ups when there is little capacity of uh, actors uh, collectively to respond given uh, the size of the needs. The strategy um, 
I think uh, that I would advise would be to be as honest uh, as possible in terms of the roles, responsibilities and the limitations um, and uh, to acknowledge uh, those needs. So uh, not having the capacity to answer and really working on uh, prioritization does not mean that those needs are not real and not, are not as uh, challenging. And I think part of the part of it is uh, also encouraging CCMs to uh, to also manage these expectations themselves with the communities when they come back with frustrations on the uh, response. I don't know if that answers uh, your question. We can uh, really go back to it those as well. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks a lot, Madalina. Yeah, very much agree. And um, I think there is always also the um, good leverage that um, CCM actors should try to uh, to have through coordination platform to make sure that the community needs are also um, reported back to the wider um, community to see if other actors maybe have the capacity to respond. Um, there are also a couple of questions related to uh, difficulties in engaging with um, women and girls and generally fighting with um, uh, against uh, um, damaging uh, cultural traditional norms that might prevent us to um, have full participation of uh, women and girls or certain group in the community. Um, so I was wondering if Jeff, um, Sorry, I've tried to pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Jahan Zeb uh, can maybe pick on this one since um, uh, he works in a very um, challenging um, context when it comes to engaging with women and girls. Um, do you have some uh, good experience from the case studies or from your experience in Afghanistan to share with us? Uh uh, sorry, I couldn't hear the first point. If you could please uh, repeat. So the difficulties in um, engaging with women and girls and um, fighting uh, against traditional norms that might prevent us to engage with these specific groups. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it was difficult. I mean, currently we are uh, in a different uh, situation. You may have heard about all of the news uh, in Afghanistan. I'm uh, I'm not uh, talking about uh, anything what is happening now, but at that time uh, when we were establishing uh, female uh, community representative committees uh, or ensuring the participation of You froze, John Zeb. Are you there? Hear me? Yep, try again. Okay, okay. Okay, so uh, what uh, approaches we use? So I will I will just talk about that. Like uh, uh, we were first uh, communicating with the male representatives and asking them if there is any any possibility to them and engaging the elder people or influential uh, people. So we use uh, very appropriately the stakeholder mapping, like having the, the positive one, the, uh, the negative one as well, and uh, finding out planning how to uh, mitigate the risk uh, from them and how to approach uh, the females. Uh, for the sensitization meeting, we uh, had a lot of uh, sensitization meet meeting. Even we in some places we had a like a separate uh, uh, community represent uh, community centers for male and females. Even we had uh, we agreed or mitigated or uh, compromised to have uh, a female uh, only day for uh, yeah. females. So that was there was some flexibility we were showing to the community and they and they were thinking that okay so there's only female and only female staff so let's uh, try if there is anything so we are here and we have control there and we were accepting or respecting all of the uh, community norms uh, considering to that and uh, fortunately they were uh, using it in the meantime we were i mean inviting some uh, health uh, related 
uh, organization like we we had an MOU with uh, Intersauce, we had an MOU with the uh, uh, psychosocial support uh, um, counseling uh, organization. So they were coming uh, in, in, from schedules, uh, using the schedules to the community centers and people were coming and they were, um, I mean, uh, receiving the services uh, like that uh, from these things. But in some community, there were um, flexibility and they were very agreed. So one community uh, is like preparing or accepting the uh, community representative committees or participation of the females. And we are using that as an example for other communities and they're seeing that, yeah, you did that there. Uh, now let's see uh, what happens here. So somehow using the examples from the different areas and showing that how much we are careful about your norms, your culture and all of the things. And then they were accepting. So, yeah, and we were hiring people from their communities, like especially the com community based staff. So they were very useful and they were uh, even in one place we we hired. Uh, there was a, an educated person and who unfortunately from from a, uh, I'm a uh, like influential family family. So he was very much active and young people. I, I found that uh, educated people were very useful or very helpful for, for us in the uh, in advocacy of the women rights and female rights in the community and they were also helping us to uh, convince the uh, community representatives uh, to have female representations and these things yeah thank you so much um i see also some of the um inputs here are related to uh the um lack of partner interest in intervening in a no-come setting uh, and um, low, uh, maybe partner presence. Um, so I was wondering if uh, Maedalina or Amelie can elaborate a bit more how they um, share the results of the impact assessments with the wider community, how they presented this and how they um, also try to um, uh, engage with, uh, with them in regards to the mixed uh, committees, uh, just to uh, yeah, tell us a bit more how you uh, you work on the coordination aspects on this. Should I uh, explain okay. that? Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, we'll we'll go to Madalina, and then would be great if you have anything to add. Okay. 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 I think I explained it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's interesting to look at the two uh, the two contexts. If you want to start, please go ahead. But I. Okay, so, so, I'll briefly say, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, please let it go. Okay. <laughs> okay, please I'll go please ahead. Please. Um, so I, <laughs> I'll split this into um, uh, two bits. One uh, is the, uh, the CCM uh, role in getting visibility and getting actors to bilaterally coordinate with them. Uh, so one is the classical coordination of this is the result. We share the email, uh, we uh, send it, we share it in meetings, and uh, those uh, this information sharing, including the GPS points, is more on the classical end. On the other end, there was a role that the CCM and the, the presence of the structure of having a community center played and making them central to the coordination of any actor that wanted to come to the camp. So the coordination started happening, the more visibility the community, the mixed community, community committees had, the more uh, NGOs and uh, international local ones came to them as a reference. What really helped legitimize them is that the Ministry of Social, uh, sorry, the Ministry of Humanitarian Action um, was referring uh, NGOs and other actors to them as well. So uh, they were really considered a key player. Uh, so one side is classical, uh, sharing the results, the data, etc. And the other side is really the presence on the field and those who you can see are actually active uh, uh, on a daily uh, basis or for specific activities would um, more automatically go to the CCM. They have their phone numbers, etc. Thanks. Uh, uh, over to you. Okay. 
uh, for the co coordination, uh, it was different to uh, different regions or uh, places. I worked in uh, different uh, places or different communities. So in one area, it was a ch challenging. Like we were working with the uh, refugee interpretation uh, ministry. So for with them, that, that was easy in the other uh, government. So we had the permission to go in this uh, community. We were meeting to the uh, local or district governor, and then they were referring us to the community representative or the available structures there. So mostly they, they were, those were, I mean, stronger people. In area, there were like uh, some conflicts among two Malaks or, uh, or uh, I, when I'm saying Malaks, it means that uh, representatives or Am I, am I audible? Yeah, 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 we can hear you. Yeah, so after the community representative committees, we were we were speaking to everyone uh, who were influential. Like we use the uh, community uh, coordination toolbox appropriately, like identifying the stakeholders, seeing like who is like negative or who is the positive one who has the interest and influence and then we were involving them and they, that was very much useful actually uh, in the time we were uh, engaging them and uh, we were collecting the support of them also uh, th th that way uh, we were able to uh, implement those things yeah over to you Christine and Wellington. Thanks a lot. Um, so we are, um, it's a very interesting discussion and we got a lot of inputs on the Mentimeter. Um, we're just moving to the next uh, slide, which was on how can we make our community engagement work successful. I see a lot of inputs related to uh, defining roles and responsibilities, um, which we know sometimes out of traditional camp settings might not be uh, that clear. Um, so great to see that um, we are all on the same page on this. Um, and I see also a lot of uh, inputs on uh, uh, on what we just said in terms of engaging the community um, um, and uh, consulting with all the group and making uh, and having a very strong community engagement um, strategy. Um, maybe just to um, uh, wrap up with some pending questions that. Uh, people had on the in two case studies. So um, on the Afghanistan one, um, maybe Jahanza, if you can, um, I mean, I think we, we cover the uh, community engagement with women and girls with our previous questions. Um, if you can um, maybe talk us about um, complementarities with development partners, if any, as I see uh, two questions related to this. Um, and um, and maybe on um, ending over the project to the women's group to make it sustainable. Uh, would you please repeat the questions? I cannot read yeah. it uh, here. Did you um, did you have any complementarities with development partners? Did you have any um, development partners um, working in the area with whom you engage with? And if so, how? and um, how you handed over the, the project to the community to ensure that, to the women's group, to ensure that it was sustainable. If you uh, can well, share some examples. Thank you for, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, actually, uh, for the de developing actors and other, other things, unfortunately, when we, uh, we were, uh, we were entering the community uh, there, uh, like totally displaced and, or uh, person uh, people with dis uh, i mean uh, those displaced uh, people idps and returnees there were no actors uh, uh, i mean available at that time uh, so therefore we were interpreting or somehow uh, finding some flexible donors to support those uh, community representative committees specifically females uh, there and we were edu uh, educating for uh, for them as well like meeting uh, participating in different clusters uh, in the uh, in the region and encouraging them to 
city there is a uh, place or settlement and you can join us and support those uh, committees uh till uh, the end of the project we we didn't have any any i mean i mean a big uh, development actors there actually there was a uh, I mean, humanitarian response for uh, continued there, and uh, nothing related to the development uh, things were there. So mostly those were in need uh, community, and the war or the conflicts were there, and there were recent or new IDPs were coming and going back. So there were operations about ISIS and other other things. So they were not sustainable. Uh, people were living there, so most of them were moving and coming back and. Uh, but there were uh, house community as well living uh, nearby villages. Uh, about how we handed over that at the beginning, we when we established those uh, shops or uh, those, so we supported them through uh, through monitoring them or going them or uh, for our female staff were training them on job training and these things. At the end, like. We handed over to those families or those females uh, by themselves. Unfortunately, there were some uh, some of the shops who left the area, some moved other places as they were IDPVs so their sustainability or their uh, uh, integration was to the third place or to the place of origin. So they took all of the things and uh, they may have uh, started uh, that. I am a male uh, person, male staff, so I was not directly engaging with the females at that time. And others who were living and who uh, integrated in the house community and, and that places or the, where they were living, they, they continued as I uh, shared the, uh, the examples. And they used only the first uh, uh, items or the cash and they uh, collected the cash back, sell all of the, uh, the items and regularly going back to the uh, wholesales and bringing those things uh, to the shops and using them for the uh, community. So that was a sustainability kind of uh, thing and handover was very much uh, easier for us or our, uh, our, kind, our kind of exact uh, strategy was uh, there. And uh, I was hearing back from the uh, from the local I mean, community structures there that was like going on most of the areas. They uh, they continued to have those meetings, and somehow uh, some of the uh, representatives who were trained by uh, by NRC Kudik uh, Urban Displacement Out of Camp Program, they still had the uh, chance, or I mean, have uh, continued their representation of the community specifically from the house community or other other places so they they continued their the, those jobs so that was a successful uh, handover or exact uh, strategies we used it thanks a lot and there were also some more inputs on this chair in the in the chat on the monitoring of the project um with some answer uh, uh, from Christine's side, so I'll, I'll invite you also to check the chat uh, if you are more interested on, on this topic, the handover and the monitoring. Um, so, uh, Maisalina and Amelie, I don't know if you can answer this, this question that was submitted on the Mentimeter about links um, towards durable solution and the mixed uh, group committee, uh, mixed community committee. Um, how um, did you approach this, if, if you approach this? Oh. Okay, thank you so much for the question. Um, so I would uh, say that lessons learned are what changes or what we decide to change or what we see changing. And I would say it's a mix of a lesson learned and a success um, in uh, taking this forward towards not necessarily building, but enabling a structure that's more um, easy to work with in terms of durable solutions. So that being the CCM, uh, because they represent the host community and the uh, IDPs and different uh, groups within them, uh, they end uh, several, yeah, at first they were not very accepted, but a few years later we now uh, receive requests from the Ministry of Humanitarian Action to create CCMs in other areas where we don't do uh, site management support. So to only do this bit at least, where they ended up uh, upgrading the existing focal point that the site manager already uh, coordinated with and having a more capacitated 
a differently organized uh, group uh, that's representative uh, acting as a somewhat uh, illegitimized uh, governance group that's now being duplicated in areas where there is not a, a GSAT or CCCM intervention. I hope that answers. Thanks a lot. And um, I mean, we're about to run out of time. It was a very interesting uh, discussion and uh, there were a lot of questions that were submitted uh, in the chat and also in the Mentimeter. I'm sorry we um, were not maybe able to answer all of them, but uh, the good thing is that um, the case studies will, uh, will be published so you can always have a look uh, at them and uh, you know let us know and get in touch if you still have pending questions that we will be happy to um, to answer to you uh, so yeah just wrapping up uh, very quickly um, if we come back can go back to the presentation um, I also wanted to give you a um, very quick update on the work that the ABA working group um, has been doing on the creation of this um, training package uh, on area based CCCM uh, which was the uh, you know big piece of work we have been focusing on right now as a working group. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you um, are not familiar with um, uh, with the training outline, um, it's um, a training package that is composed of ten modules. It's going through final review right now, and you know after it's uh, uh, reviewed and approved, um, the um, that it will go online as the global CCM training package and it will be available for CCM trainer. Um, you can see um, the, the main topic that are covered by the training package. Uh, and there are two, um, I mean, community engagement is a topic throughout the training package, I would say, but there are two um, main uh, modules that are focused on, on this. Uh, next slide. Uh, the first one is uh, training now, uh, module number seven on participation and representation, and the uh, and the other one is module number eight on providing information and listening back. Uh, so here I try to kind of summarize the context of these two contact uh, content of these two modules. So um, for your information, and, and since we are still in the finalization phase, if you feel like there should be more topics covered, um, um, we are happy to receive your. Um, your support. Um, Christine is also part of the uh, group of colleagues that is reviewing the training package, so we're working on this together. Um, in the in the module seven, we go through a, a specific specific feature of community participation in our base CCM. Um, we also go through the main responsibility of of community representative structure in this type of out of traditional camp settings, um, and we have. Uh, different exercises to practice how we can support them from capacity building to community led projects um, to um, prioritization mapping with them and, and action plan and creating action plan in, uh, in cooperation with them. Um, while in module eight, um, we look at some um, um, strategies and particular particularities of disseminating messages to the community. Uh, in out of traditional camp settings, but also the difficulties in um, uh, establishing a uh, complaints and feedback mechanism, how we can overcome that. Um, and we also have a very new uh, component on um, um, rumors uh, and, and how to tackle rumors, uh, especially in out of traditional camp setting, uh, which are very uh, much uh, thanks. Uh, Thomas, who is us with Tom, who is uh, with us today, who um, uh, who actually uh, gave his training material to be included on um, on this module for um, um, you know moving forward on on rumors. Um, so if you have any suggestion, please do share them with us. I mean, we're always happy to hear uh, since it's uh, still in the finalization phase, and we really want this to be as useful as possible. Um, and uh, as useful as possible to tackle some of the challenges that you highlighted today during the uh, during the webinar. Um, and just to finish very much on time, <laughs> a few final words. Uh, so first of all, please do use the community um, engagement and area based approaches hashtag uh, on the community engagement forum. Um, if you're not part of the community engagement forum, uh, you know you are encouraged to to 
to subscribe. It's a very, uh, it's a great uh, platform and a lot of resources are sharing on a weekly basis. Um, we will going to share the, uh, the case studies, the two case studies. We also have the French version for the Burkina Faso case study, which are very much thanks our uh, acted and impact colleague um, uh, for. So we'll have the two uh, English and, and French version. Um, and, you know, if you want to uh, also um, do a similar case study very briefly, like four pages, uh, please do get in touch and uh, we, will we will be happy to cooperate with you. Um, and, uh, yeah, you have our uh, contact in, in the slides and we hope to see you soon in other events. Thanks very much, Elena. Um, do anyone have any questions to Elena or Francesco as the um, chairs of the Area Based Working Group or to me as the moderator of the Community Engagement Forum or to any of our esteemed colleagues um, um, who were presenting from the different locations? Um, there is a, a Najibullah. Najib, did you raise your hand? You're on mute. You can, sorry, un unmute because still on mute. There you go. Am I, do you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me uh, to this valuable meeting for discussion. Uh, second is I'm very much familiar with the uh, activities that both acted and uh, Norwegian supported uh, units have been doing in Afghanistan. Basically, I'm talking about 90s and afterward 2000, until 2010. And after that, I wasn't very much uh, involved in it. Uh, I value the activities that they have been doing, their engagement and development activities and their uh, uh, support to IDPs and returnees who, who were returning to Afghanistan during that uh, period. So now my point is that uh, uh, at the time that the colleague mentioned about the activities in Jalalabad, managing uh, uh, camps and so on, my point is what will be their suggestion to do now this activity with the new reality that we are facing since 2021, August 2021. Mm -hmm. So how will be their suggestion that how we can manage that? Because in 2000 and 2020, you know, until 2021, things were yeah. different than what we are facing now. What will be their suggestion? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Very uh, uh, important and useful questions. Uh, fortunately, we are, I am currently working uh, with ECI, Enable Children Initiative. We are working for children with disability and uh, difficult. Uh, for, I mean, email or banned from working, but in Norwegian Refugee Council has already got <coughs> uh, through communication. If we have like, uh, like, uh, trouble level, star level communication uh, thing, or following their general rules, like they have their degree, specifically, when we were saying that it is difficult, I, uh, yeah, it is difficult but not impossible. We are 100% female are working. So you will be surprised. We are an international organization as well. And uh, in our senior vision, if you, uh, council is also working and camp management, CCCM is also working. They have their community centers, but with some modalities or some compromisation, like having separate for females or having more uh, strategic. If we were uh, collecting, uh, permission or a letter from uh, only refugee department at, at that time. Now we are collecting that from refugee department, from the uh, district uh, uh, police department, from the headquarters, from the some some uh, more uh, level of the, there. So and having Maharam for the staff and having uh, all of the uh, using the uh, hijab and, uh, and then these things uh, in, in place. Or have some uh, having extra facilities for female. Uh, so uh, things are not impossible actually, but 
we uh, need to uh, work more. I mean, in this situation, uh, I'm not working with NRC, but uh, surprisingly, or uh, I can appreciate the NRC colleagues, they, they are still working. They are still working in uh, um, uh, in Herat. They were active in Herat uh, earthquake, and they they were active in um, the current uh, influx uh, who are coming from Pakistan. They are in Jalalabad in eastern region. Uh, they are working, and I hear uh, I hear from them. They are um, they are working. Even like what the modalities that you what I hear from my staff or not going to the offices as they are banned from. Offices, but they can go to the community. So if they can work in the community, so that is fine. So they are providing uh, transportation from home to the community, and they are working in the community like a mobile site uh, management. So some modalities and some, uh, <coughs> and some extra level of uh, carefulness uh, can be used here. I hope I can. I I, I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, basically, I was working with both uh, ACTED and uh, Nor Norwegian, uh, no different uh, NGOs from Norway, like NAC, uh, NRCA, and so on. I'm sorry, I cannot remember all those uh, uh, names now, uh, but uh, they were doing a huge job. I remember yeah. what they have done in northeastern in Afghanistan, in Badakhshan province, in Takhar, and so on. So really, I'm thankful to them. And we were working together because I was working for the WFP and I was supporting their project in terms of put forward projects. And, the, <clears throat> and the, their uh, efforts were are very common. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, and thanks for answering um, the question, Jan Seb. Um, are there anyone else who have any questions to Jan Seb or Magdalena or um, myself or Francesco from the Area Based Working Group? Um, I will be posting the um, uh, the recording of this session, as well as um, the slides and the, um, the template for the case studies, if you want to create your own case study, and these two case studies that have been presented. I'll post that all on the community engagement forum. Um, so if you're not a member, join us and get access to all of this exciting content. Um, and I just want to say thanks again to our presenters and uh, uh, for everyone who participated in the discussion and were listening in and made this a very, very interesting uh, webinar indeed. So thank you and goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Seth. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a nice day.